Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. We are so sorry for the technical glitch, but we are here live and it is Wednesday night and that means it's time for Friends in Fiction. And even with tech glitches, it is the happiest and best night of the week. And we are so happy to be here with you. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends in Fiction. Four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, librarians, and you watching us. Tonight, we are talking with Lisa Scottolini. We love Lisa Scottolini. And we'll be talking about her writing life, her new book, What Happened to the Bennett. Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> Co-writing with her daughter and of course, dogs, always her dogs. <laughs> and as you know, we continue to encourage you all to um, support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one way to do that is to visit our own friends and fiction bookshop.org page where you can find Lisa's books, all 70 or 80 of them. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. We also want to remind you that Christie's newest to the wedding veil is out yeah. next week, which we're so excited about. So yeah. six days from now and Mary Kay's the new, the, um, I'm completely blanking. The home, um, record. the home records is out of me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just got out of five hours in the car. I'm my brains everywhere. And of mm -hmm. course they are available wherever books are sold. But if you want a hand signed first edition of both books, plus a free gift, which is that nice little notebook in the middle that comes with sticky notes. You can order the spring box from our friends at independent bookstore, Oxford Exchange. You will receive a beautiful delivery of both books, each of them signed. So it's a great opportunity to get your books autographed uh, as soon as they are released. So they'll get to you right away. And if you haven't read my 2021 book and Patty's 2021 book, which are Surviving Savannah and The Forest of Vanishing Stars, those are coming this spring, the first week of April and the first week of May in paperback. And hopefully you were one of the 500 people who entered our recent giveaway with Page One Books. And so tonight we are going to announce the winner uh, drum roll, please. If only we had a guy that. Oh, yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our Me winner... and sound effects. I'm really good at it. You're excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our winner is Julia Kushnerov from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Julia, as our lucky winner, you get to choose between the Boozy Reader Bundle or the Jane Austen Persuasion Bundle. And Meg will be in touch to hook you up. Meanwhile, everybody out there, you know about our special Page One Books discount, right? When you sign up for a page one subscription package, you get 15% off with code all caps friends 15. And thank you all of you for supporting our sponsors. And I have to tell you about something that you are not going to want to miss. One, Miss Mary Kay Andrews has a huge launch party coming up. Do you want to tell us about it? I would love to tell you all about it. So it's going to be the Atlanta launch is Saturday, April April 30th at Huff Harrington Home, which is a gorgeous art gallery and home furnishings shop in um, Brookhaven or Peachtree Hills in Atlanta. And that's from 2 to 4 p.m. And we will put the links to um, Foxtail Books as our bookseller. And you can go tonight to their page and buy your ticket. Or we'll put all the uh, graphics up on my page and on Friends in Fiction tomorrow. We're hoping to see so many 
friendly faces. Um, and we can't wait. I can't wait. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. Okay. Before we introduce Lisa, I want to bring on our beloved surprise guest, Ron Block, for Yay. a huge announcement. Y'all are going to be so excited. And he's going to stay for a bit because he loves what happened to the Bennetts as much as we do. And he has a question for Lisa. Could you bring Ron on, Sean? Hey. Hi, Ron. It's about time. <laughs> I know, right? I know. It's perseverance, perseverance. Nothing okay. like a glitch. We haven't had one of those in a while. No. Not that long. Not, Not that, that kind long. of glitch. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. You ready? Yes. <clears throat> this has been under wraps for so long. And we just wanted to share first with our friends and fiction family. After many, many attempts to put this together, we're so <laughs> thrilled to announce the next location for a friends and fiction live event. <clears throat> yes, it's the Fab Four and Meg will be joining me on May 4th at the Cuyahoga County Public Library in Yay! Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> And the links are going to be in the comments, and they are live right now. So you all get first crack at the tickets for this. It's going to be amazing. And um, I can't even tell you how thrilled I am about this. So the, the, go to the link. The tickets are going to include a hardcover copy of Mary Kay's The Homewreckers and a copy of Kristen's the Forest of Vanishing Stars in paperback. We'll also have copies of The Wedding Veil, Surviving Savannah, and many other backlist titles available for purchase and signing. But wait. There's also an opportunity to join for an exclusive and limited pre-show meet and greet to benefit our library foundation. And thank you all for agreeing to do that. That's been so generous. Of you all. We're so excited. Uh, it's uh, just before Mother's Day. So yes. it's a perfect Mother's Day gift for yourself and someone else yeah. or someone else. And um, it's uh, so if you have any questions, reach out to me on Facebook. Go to CuyahogaLibrary.org. Follow the links. You better get those tickets while you can because they are not going to last. Yay! I'm so excited. Oh, man. I oh, can't yeah. even tell you. <laughs> so we have been cooking this up, like stirring it like witches in a pot. Yeah. <laughs> Very quiet. And we're so excited. So it's We're so, so bad cool. about secret keeping. Oh, my gosh. We're bad. <laughs> we we're bad, told. but we did it. Uh -huh. yeah, you, don't yep. have to live, you don't have to live in Cleveland to, to join us. You can not at all. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. that's new. You know, we had people come from all over when we were in the Savannah book festival. Yeah, um, right. yeah. February. So don't yeah. think you have to live in Cleveland, although Cleveland rocks. Cleveland rocks. Rocks. <laughs> and if Road you need trip. hotel, hotel recommendations, again, reach out to me on Facebook. I... Or you could just stay at Ron's. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Ron and Jeff would be happy to have you. Ron wants to have everyone in well, his house. Uh, light him up. I'll get it's lots Ron of blow-up like, mattresses. Hey, can, can we have another tech glitch? Hurry, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wait, wait, is this thing on? <laughs> is it hello? Okay. okay. Now, go ahead. No, you're now with our book subscription in hand. <laughs> let's go. Our guest for the evening. Hey, what's up? Okay. Oh, wait. Not yet. Not yet. Go ahead, Mary Kay. Oh, okay. So as well as being a long time, and can I just say that Lisa and I have been together longer than either of her marriages? I'm just saying that. Lisa, <laughs> Lisa is a number one best-selling New York Times best-selling author, Edgar Award-winning author of over 30 novels. She has more than 30 million copies of her books in print and is published in 35 countries. Amazing. She also writes a weekly column in the Philadelphia Inquirer with her daughter, Francesca Saratella, which is titled Chick Wit and shares a witty and fun take on life from a woman's perspective. The stories from these columns, along with several other never before published stories, have been collected in a New York Times bestselling series of humorous memoirs, including their most recent I See Life Through Rose Colored Glasses, which are my favorite colored glasses too. Mm -hmm. Mine too. Too. What a coincidence. Yeah. Lisa reviews popular fiction and nonfiction, and her reviews have appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. She previously served as president of Mystery Writers of America and taught a course she developed, Justice and Fiction, at her alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She lives in the Philadelphia area, very near the block where little Patty grew up. Aww. And her new book, What Happened to the Bennetts, is out next week 
on March 29th. Sean, can you bring Lisa on? For real this yeah. time. For real this Yay! time. <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. Thank you for having me, you guys. I love you guys. Oh, yes, we, we love, love you. you. Such a good thing. Thank you. I just want to give you some love right up front because I think you're you're helping other authors, your women helping with me and with the thanks, Ron, for being here. But you're doing something <laughs> really special at a hard time for everybody. And it's just a way to connect. And I was really looking forward to this. So thank you for your perseverance through all the technical <laughs> Thanks to everybody who was so patient with us. Yes. Oh, and Lisa, thank you for your patience. Good Lord. Yes. We, I, and for y'all out there, we tried to get on six or seven times and Lisa <laughs> sat there through all of them. So <laughs> wow. got nothing else to do, man. I'm here. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you have nothing else to do. So right. Lisa, I love this book, What Happened to the Bennetts, so much. I tried to get guess the outcome. And yet you did that magical thing that is so difficult, making it both inevitable and surprising. Aww. So before we take a deeper dive, can you tell us a little bit about what happened to the Bennetts? Oh, Patty, you're so nice to say that. You know, I loved your books as well, Surviving Savannah. I mean, you could go on and on. And we also have to say before we even start that the wedding veil is out the same day. So we share a pub day. Yeah. sisters. <laughs> That's like being star sisters. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. It's like, yeah. Uh, but um, so what happened to the Bennetts is the story of a family driving home from a field hockey game. And they get carjacked and it goes horribly, tragically wrong. And by the next morning, they find themselves in the Federal Witness Protection Program. And I just kind of wanted to look at, you know, all of the connections we have. Like in a way, this show is a perfect case in point. Kathy and I have been friends forever. Like, even though we're quite young, you know, we have <laughs> connections that go back. We are connected as people. And families, modern families have all those connections, you know. And some are by text and some are face to face and some are virtual. And what happens is that the WITSEC program is designed for criminals, right? It's designed for bad guys who seek protection from other bad guys. Maybe they're not on Facebook, but when you put a, a regular family in that situation, yeah. they have to leave everything behind. And we can talk more about that if you want. But the whole notion that you can't say goodbye to anybody, that the characters, for example, he has a business, he can't go to work the next day. His wife is a photographer business. Her mother's in assisted living in memory care. She can't say goodbye to her. The kids have to leave their school and soccer practice and violin and, and, and text and chat, chat. You know, you think the pandemic was bad. They can't connect virtually at all. So that's really what, what I wanted to explore. It's really a way, in a way, when I see you guys and these lovely faces, it's kind of like, including Ron's, who's lovely in his own right, uh, that... <laughs> You know, the, these connections and how they endure and how they keep us all going through hard times and what happens, like in what happened to the Bennetts when you take that all away. That's what I was really trying to explore. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Really amazing. And um, as, as as I've told you before, this is the kind of book where you just have to buckle up and, and just yeah. take everything off your calendar because once you start, you are in for the ride and you're not going to put it down. I lost a lot of sleep. Now, yeah. it is oh. a twisting, nail-biting ride in all the best ways. And we all want to okay. know, what was the original spark for the novel? Was it the witness protection program? Idea of the normal family being thrust into something very outrageous? Where did it come from? You know, that would be the impressive answer. But the real <laughs> true answer, which you get from Scottolini, is that <laughs> I, I hate tailgaters. That's where it comes from. I, oh, I, I love that. that. I hate it. I, I love it. it. Not above it. Uh, I used to be a lawyer. I tell you that, even though I want you to like me, but I follow the rules. I don't speed. And if I'm going to drive and, and I drive, if I, I go in the slow lane because everybody wants to go past and that's where it comes from. I just was like, you know, you're driving along. It's always me with a couple of dogs in the backseat, all cavaliers, completely useless animals, you know? And I go, <laughs> wow, what if I, uh, what if I were, what if this tailgater carjacked me? What would I do? And that's was the idea. And that's where it came from. It just came from that people drive too fast and they need to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's that's such, such an unexpected place. That's amazing. That amazing. 
I love it. I love well, it. Well, you so, guys know that we just live in the world like everybody yeah. else. We're like, that's yeah. the kind of stuff that occurs to you. And it's not a very large concept, but it's a teeny tiny one. <laughs> yeah. It's this weed that starts a story. It is yeah. absolutely. And I think what triggers awesome. you, what triggers you lots yeah. of times is you know, that's where what's what sets you off. Yes. Yeah. Right. And everything's and also, material. I it's where yeah, the energy yeah. is. Exactly. Mary Kay, if something sets you off, there's like this buzzy energy with it. So use it. I love right. it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, also, if you grow up with an Italian mother and then you actually become one like me. You know, my mother could di imagine disasters, like when the leaves were wet, you know, or it's the running with scissors or it's to hold the pencil down, not up. Like <laughs> everything is fraught with peril. In your <laughs> so, God forbid you're driving and someone is too close. You're like, ah, I got it. But anyway, Ron, I'm going to ask something I interrupted. You. That's all. No, no. I was just going to say that I now have to leave. And I was going to say bye, bitches. But my mother might be watching. My, mo <laughs> my, mother, my mother might be watching. So I'll say. So don't say out, bye, bitches. Peace out. And um, love to all of you. I'll see you soon. Love, love, you, love you. You know, hi, Ellen. See you soon, See you soon. Yes. See you soon. yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, Lisa, I grew up in a house fraught with peril also not not just a house like a, a family you know like a worst case scenario <laughs> exactly exactly and that's me and like if I call my husband and he doesn't answer it's not like he's busy at work he's dead in a gutter like one <laughs> an active shooter has come okay. in the building Wait, he's dead, in a, dead in a gutter is a great book title I'm just telling you that right now Wait, <laughs> well, in our family, it's always dead in a ditch. You didn't call. I just assumed you were dead in a ditch. <laughs> and that's what the thing was, too, because I realized when I was writing this, you know, when you go with this premise, because then I get the FBI, the FBI guy who's my source. And I go, and he actually worked in WITSEC. And I'm like, wait, let me get this straight. You can't even tell, like, uh, my best friend, I see her. We do things. She, if she texts me and I don't text her back, she goes, well, that's weird. You know, yeah. you can't even, you know, we do a lot of checking in throughout the day. Like when she yep. flies, I say, let me know when you land. Because yep. when you're a single girl, you're like, no one knows what happens to you. So, if, you know, so a little bit, we check on each other. And you can't even say to your best friends or your family, don't worry about me. A bad thing happened and I have to go in hiding. You can't even reassure them. So yeah. what happens is, and you know better than anybody because you guys are so savvy with social media that people start, post, you know, in the yeah. absence of an explanation, they yeah. come up with a narrative, right? We're all storytellers. That's what I love about you guys. And what I love when people watch you because it's like, we can, you can write a book. Every single one of us can write a book. If we can do it, you can do it. True. You know? And, and yeah. so everyone's going to tell a story and imagine, wait a minute, they were here. They always put the recycling out. They walk the dog. He, play, he, he runs, she does yoga. What happened to the Bennetts? Yeah. And then the Facebook people get on the act and the whole thing's that, well, it's your basic nightmare. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Well, it's a great premise. Um, and you also co-write with your daughter, which we find really fascinating. We mentioned yeah. your weekly column in the Phil in Philadelphia called Chick Wit. And um, your book that has, we love your titles, things like Have a Nice Guilt Trip. It's really good. <laughs> Um, no, I have a design blog with my mom. So this really resonates with me, this whole like mother-daughter dynamic. But I'm always so interested in how other mother-daughter duos navigate this. So, Right. Us. Well, we, we fight it out. She has a mean uppercut, but I kind of like get getting out. You know, we, <laughs> she always says like, oh, we work great across state lines because she lives in New York. And I'm like, ha ha, that's funny. You're, you're grounded. <laughs> um, so basically... But it's great because she's actually, you know, she's she writes on her own. We write about just our lives in the hope, as you know, you know, that if you write about your own life with honesty, you don't have to be honest. You can't. You have to tell like, you know, the literal truth, like you're going to look and find your first great chin hair and realize, you know, you're turning into an Amish man, which is great. <laughs> really great. But you also have to tell the emotional truth, like that maybe if you get lonely or maybe you're nervous or whatever that stuff is. Yeah. And so I just tell it from my point of view and she tells it from hers. Um, but happily and amazingly, thanks to the support of all of you know, wonderful people who follow you guys and my, and my readers and hers, she wrote her first novel called Ghosts of Harvard this year. And after all yeah. writing with me, she's she's flapping her wings, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, that's all we really want for our children yeah. to be happy and find their own voice. And she literally did, which is kind of great. 
That's, That's so awesome. cool. I love awesome. that. Well, speaking of navigating a big life, um, you have a collection of animals all about you, horses and dogs and chickens, <laughs> and you've received more awards than we can possibly list. And yet we get the feeling that your animals and your daughter are what you cherish the most. So yeah. how do you maintain balance between, you know, all of these things pulling at your time and attention? Well, you're so sweet to, to because, but I, you know what I think is great about us uh, and it's great about women now, but Ron's on here with, no, I'm looking. Um, <laughs> that we go forward. Yeah. We yeah. go forward. Right. Yeah. Kathy. Yeah. We, we put one foot in front of the other and we're kind of the glue in these families. And even if you're a single mom like me and you have a daughter, you know, she was mugged. She calls me at four in the morning. I'm there. I don't know why I'm saying this, but my point is this, that, that we're there for each other. And you just try to, you realize in your life that, okay, maybe, maybe I didn't know I'd be so incredibly single, which is good word for celibate, you know, and, <laughs> and my, <laughs> stage my life. You know, I spend way too much time fantasizing about Bradley Cooper and that's really <laughs> pathetic, like pathetic. But yeah, because, on the because, other hand, no, because Paul Rudd is much hotter than Bradley Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm role models. I have role models memorized. Don't even start with me. But um, <laughs> but that I think the balance comes when you go. Well, the balance unfortunately comes because well, I don't have to worry about that husband thing. On the other hand, I get the whole closet. But I always feel so lucky and blessed. I just do. I just yeah. and I guess maybe because Kathy knows we go way back and years of struggle as a writer when you publish first in paperback that I got to be a writer, that I get to live a life in books, so that I fill my life up with love. And maybe there's not a guy, but there's 14 chickens. That's a pretty good trade-off. <laughs> <laughs> at least somebody around here has eggs, because guess who does? I was going to say, at least they give you eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got those too many dogs and cats, and I got two horses. And you know what was kind of great, and I feel so lucky, is nobody is around to tell me that I can't. Yeah. And I must tell you, speaking very seriously for a moment, that especially if you've been a single mom or, you know, we, we as mothers, we put so this is kind of my turn. Yeah. I get to put myself first for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm really very lucky and, and blessed in that. I thank I thank God every day for that. Yep. That's awesome. It's amazing. OK, now let's get down to write what you know, Lisa. OK. <laughs> and it's true. You have put so much of yourself in your books starting with your first beloved legal mystery series with Rosado and D'Annunzio, and then branching out to the standalone thrillers, many of which have a domestic aspect, which I think is, you know, it's just so, it's so appropriate. I think you were probably one of the first women mystery slash thriller writers to do that. What part of you, because, you know, we know that you went to law school, you law clerk, did you actually practice law? Yes. Okay, she practiced. I was a trial lawyer. Um, yeah. Okay. So we know that fed into the Rosado D'Annunzio books, but what part of yourself do you think ended up in what happened to the Bennett's besides, I mean, besides the tailgater? Right. Well, I think, you know, I think what you learn in life, look at me getting off. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so philosophical, is that you have to be yourself. My mother always yeah. told me that. So when you start to write the book, originally, I remember way back when thinking, well, this is a legal thriller, but this character, and she's a young woman in South Philly, which is kind of what I was, she goes home from Sunday dinner. And I was like, I never saw that in a book. Like, can you do that? That's weird. Yeah. And then you realize that I think to a certain extent, that's what, uh, you know, we bring that perspective as women. You yeah. can't ignore the domestic angle. And it's, and I remember the early reviews that think like, oh, it's, she's good in the domestic detail. And I was like, dude, you're missing the point kind of. Yeah, the domestic, yeah. look, we will all have jobs that we love, but our family yeah. is what matters to us. And it's just as simple as that. And yeah. so that's why it should be in our fiction. That's why people relate to our fiction. And, and so I for, sort of feel like that's kind of the standing in your own truth, being yourself part of the story. Yeah. And that's what we bring to it. And um, so that I never want to trivialize that. I actually think it's important and I think I love that there's more more people writing about that and men as well. So yeah. Ben, you know, he's a man, he's a male main character for women for a long time. I only wrote women. And then I'm finally like, you know, you could tr just try to write a man because I'm like kind of insecure. Yeah. So I need a lot of support, which I give myself. 
<laughs> sorry. Wait, that, that, your other that was words. way too. That was way too South Philly for this crowd. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it is not. Lisa, one of your other standalone um, thrillers had a male protagonist too, right. and um, his wife. That was. I love that book. I still think about that book. Thank you. Well, you know what? I was super close to my dad. And I challenged my dad for this. I channeled him rather, because for me, you know, we're really concerned as a society with superpowers. Like I go to the Marvel movies, those movies, $500 million they make. And I look at that and I go, because I'm always sort of looking at the fiction and why is it in contextual, politically, socially, why now? And I think we're always trying to figure out the limits of our power and particularly men, because unfortunately so much is thrust upon them to kind of like, you must be all these things. And, and my dad wasn't like that. I, I was very close to him and he, believe it or not, I was a quiet guy, <laughs> and, but my mom wasn't, so who am I like? And, but he was always <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> thinking. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, really steady and really loving and always there. And so this character, yeah. Jason Bennett, you know, he doesn't perceive himself as a hero. But whenever you write a book with a lead, whether it's a hero or a heroine, you know, Nora Ephron says, be the heroine in your own life, not the victim. I kind of love that because we don't, was when we don't always conceive of ourselves as the actor, as the main character, because we're in a supporting role. Oh, you need orange slices at three o'clock? Got it. Why didn't you tell me yesterday? But in any event. So, yeah. so I, I really wanted to bring my dad to life to a certain extent and okay. see him shepherd this family after this awful thing happens. He has yeah. to step into a role as hero he never has before. Right. And, you know, I think and, uh, you know, um, I think each book we write changes us a little bit. Oh, did this, book, that. did this book change you? In any yes, way? It did. you know, I wrote Eternal before this, which was historical fiction. And that was people going through Mussolini's fascism in World right. War II. Right. And then we came to this and I thought, you know, in a way, people look at these covers and they go, well, that's different. Historical fiction is different from thriller. And that's when I learned that that you can't tell a book by its cover is a trite way to put it. Yeah. But those def, those setting and time are merely um, form over substance. So what I learned from Eternal is that person going through hardship can be Mussolini's Italy, which is awful and horrific. Yeah. But it can also be that your whole family is taken from you and your world is taken from your family. Yeah. And mm. that to a certain extent, Bennett's made me, I feel like to a certain extent, when you go through these hardships with these characters, especially if you don't write with an outline, you're totally panicking for about a year of your life. Yeah. <laughs> how are they going to get out of this? Because truly you're as the author going, how am I going to get them out of this? Yep. Can we get out of this? And it, at the end of Eternal, you know, there's this character Maria and she says what she looks in her refrigerator and says, what can I make with what I have? And I thought that's the perfect, that's a very female housewife yeah. home cook approach to how do I survive? We don't ask ourselves yeah. beginning of the pandemic, right? All of a sudden we're, we're getting groceries delivered and we have fantastic and we're spraying cereal boxes. My daughter's home. We're spraying inanimate objects. Yeah. Terrified that they'll kill us. Like when was the last yeah. time we were afraid of Saran wrap? Uh, last March. So Yep. How we each, so each book does change yeah. me because when she was concerned, I need the pep talk. And each book reminds me, you can get yeah. through this. You will get through this. Yeah. That's what I think. I never thought about it, but no one ever asked me that before. Catherine, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, like, you. pull it out of here. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, you. <laughs> I'm not even drinking. Look, I have like this. Oh come on! You know we got We know you have a white claw in that can. <laughs> <laughs> well, we Lisa, your vodka in there. Ex exactly <laughs> right. So, Lisa, I'm glad that you mentioned Eternal because, as you know, I just finished listening to it on audiobook today, and I am kicking myself for not reading it earlier because. Um, I I don't know why I didn't. I think I'm just so busy with blurbing and you know trying to keep up right. with a six-year-old and all the minutia of life and everything. Um, I, it, it was truly one of the best historical fiction novels I've ever read, which is all the more stunning because it was your first 
your first step into historical fiction, right? I mean, this was something that's outside of your normal genre. Um, and for those of you out there who haven't read it, it's incredible. It, you know, most historical fiction, I think, spans a period of time, like a small period of time. This spanned all of World War II and the years before and after. I mean, it's an epic. It's this beautiful... I like I I I don't even think I've mustered my thoughts about it yet because I just finished it and had anyways I I could go on for the next thirty minutes but we don't have thirty <laughs> minutes um so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about it one how was that for you doing something that was so far outside of what writing books is never a comfort zone I think we push ourselves each time but how was right. that to do something that was outside of the norm for you something you hadn't done that stretched you maybe more than you expected. Right. Well, Kristen, first, I just have to say, you know, I love you and I love your books and the Forest of Vanishing Stars. I will never forget those scenes in the woods. I'll never forget. I mean, they stay with you. And it was just such an amazing and unique, uniquely original take on these horrific yeah. times. And yeah. it had that naturalism that was in Crawdads that I, I kind of loved in Crawdads. And I thought you really picked up that. They just was really just a stunning book. And we're, I just feel so lucky to be able to talk to you guys like this. And then, uh, I guess there's other people listening, so I should get try to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what it was. You know, the truth is, I, I told you I'm insecure, and I'm incredible. I am. So I didn't know if I could do it, and I was like, can you do it? Can you do it? And finally, yeah. I just like, but you know, sometimes you get tired of doubting yourself. Um, You just go, oh, my gosh. Kat, right? Mary Kay, write that down. She takes our notes. Write that yeah. down. <laughs> I'm tired, yeah, of tired of doubting yourself. And I finally thought, and I read um, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And I was like, she yeah. said in it something like, women often don't take risk, but they don't say that. They say, I'm not ready. And I was saying, I'm not ready for years. And I yeah. love historical fiction. Yeah. And I read yeah. it like a fiend. And I'd always want to write that idea. And now I'm writing another one. And that's why I say to Kristen, it's amazing because honestly, that's when I said to myself, oh my God. Now I've written a thriller and I've written historical fiction yeah. and I'm writing historical fiction next. Title is Sacred. It's about the rise can't, of democracy in Sicily. Oh, I was, can't it's, wait. It's, it's no different. You know, yeah. and, and right, people can write, it doesn't matter when you said it. It doesn't matter. It's still a story. And the core, all of you, all yes. of your stories are about family. Every single yeah. one of them. I'm looking at the beginning pages of The Wedding Veil. It's, it's three sisters. It's a mom. It's, oh my God, I'm there. You know, and I don't have a sister, but I can tell I'm going to vicariously because I always want one. But I have best besties, as we know. We all get our besties and there are sisters that we choose. So, so next you're writing erotica. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> my imagination. That her big announcement. <laughs> and neither is my memory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh all right well so that is amazing that you're writing another historical fiction like best news ever i, I better I love my life i feel so grateful in my life that i can write everything and really it's it's just where that's the first amendment part of our show that's so great you can just write it and if, and god bless readers who i mean i because you know this is where i tell you that i read my reviews online oh, so i look at yeah. good reads every day yeah i do but i love when they say um you know, I don't read historical fiction, but I like this. And I'm hoping that I'll get people who, uh, you know, yep. read Eternal and go, well, I'm going to give her a chance because I liked Eternal and I don't really like thrillers, but you that's really so can't tell a book by its cover. You just yeah. can't. That's, that's so true. And you can't fit things so neatly into a genre. Okay. So quick follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that pushing yourself to stretch to write this wonderful sweeping historical fiction story has has taught you to stretch in your other writing too? Like, do you think this has kind of opened up new avenues to you in the future? Not in terms of um, of different genres like erotica. I, Sean is no. suggesting Bradley Cooper erotica fan fiction, which sounds like a great idea. I don't see why you're not doing that. <laughs> but, um, I would get arrested. <laughs> she does have flat Bradley. I still, do you still have I flat do. Bradley? He's upstairs. Flat don't Bradley. Oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> Is that a euphemism? Oh, I'm How dare you? Keep it clean, Kathy. <laughs> she does not know how, Lisa. <laughs> but aside from Flat Bradley and your future Bradley Cooper erotica, has had, do you think that giving yourself the permission to stretch that way with Eternal opened up other doors for you as a writer? What will that will that push you to new and greater levels in the future? Do you think? Well, you're so nice. I mean, I you you hope so, but mm -hmm. 
But I have yeah. to tell you, just as a personal matter, in your heart, you feel better. Yeah. Because you, and, and it's great. It's like you, you know, you're younger, Kristen. But Not you so much. Still, but really, but when you're in this life for so long, and God bless these readers who, who enable you to stay there, you don't yeah. want to always do the same thing. Yep. And if there's something that your heart speaks to you, and especially when you start to become your own boss and kind of step into that and own that a little, yes. then you go, what else are you living for? Yeah. What else are you living for? You have to do what you want to do and you have to be you. And so that I got to do that and then people read it and gave me a chance because not that's a very generous thing of people to do. You know, I always tell analogies when you go to a restaurant. I know this restaurant I have to go with with my daughter. It's this little hole in the wall place in New York. They change the menu. I'm like, don't change the menu. I want yes. the salmon with the couscous with that white goop. I don't know what it is. It tastes great. <laughs> but and I'm a little bit and I learned from that. I said, don't be that way. You don't have to yeah. have the salmon every time. Try the halibut. Open yeah. it up, kid. And life <laughs> and so you're Kristen, it's a lovely question. As a personal matter, I'm so gratified that yeah. I tried it, that I kind of showed myself I could do it, because yeah. that's the only person you're really talking to. And that the readers came to it and said, Oh yeah, you did it. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's really nice. We, you sure did. You did it. You're so sweet. amazing. Well, what a gift we have in this profession. And in these readers who are so loyal and supportive. Yeah, and, you're and so right. Books, for supporting bookstores because we need independent bookstores. We just need bookstores in our communities. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it's a great reminder for all of us because I, when I first went to write Mrs. Lewis and I told somebody my idea and they said, why don't you write it? I said, because I don't write historical fiction. And the minute it fell out of my mouth, I was like, that is the stupidest thing to say. Yeah. I can write whatever I want. Doesn't mean they're going to buy it, but right. I can write whatever yeah. I want. And uh, right. I love it. You live by example, my friend. Yeah. Okay, we have so many live questions. Oh. Um, so Mary Kay, I'm gonna let you go first, my friend. Okay, well, you know, we have to always ask Kathy All's um, live questions because she's Meg's mom. <laughs> <laughs> also, and we love her. And we love her. We love her. Uh, Kathy wants to know, and these are two favorite characters of mine. As you know, Lisa, she wants to know, will Rosado and Nanunzio make a comeback? Oh, well, thank you for asking. Yes. The answer is yes. I'm going to do them after the historical. And I'm good because I miss them. Isn't that weird when you start missing fictional people? I dream I, about them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I do. I've done that too. Yeah. And sometimes you hear their voice coming out of your head. See, yeah. we're all a little nutty. Oh, they're, but, um, they're just so great together. I mean, they have that kind of Starsky and Hutch energy, if I can date myself. Capacity <laughs> and the Sundance Kid thing. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. No, thank you for that question. I miss them too. It's interesting right. when you're, you know, just doing various things. You know, standalone is a different matter from a series. Yeah. A series like oh, Friends Over Time, you know, like the way we go back. And you, and that's the exploration. And I miss that. So yeah. I will do it. Great way to explain it. Okay, so we've got a question from Joyce Merrill, but first I wanted to read a quick comment from Maria Liu, who says, The Ghosts of Harvard was awesome. I loved it. And of course, that's your daughter Francesca's book. So, um, you know, we know a lot of people in our community have read it. Uh, it's such a great book. And well, we're, we're happy that happy our friends and fiction readers have embraced that too. Thank so you. Joyce, I'm so, I'm so happy. You know, I'm lactating right now, actually. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> I will say, because I'm a proud mom, that it was nominated for best um, best debut thriller, which was really great. So I appreciate that you guys Amazing. read it. It's such a nice thing. Oh, that's awesome. Well, good. Okay, so Joyce Merrill's question is, Lisa, what is your writing schedule? My writing schedule is, well, you remember I told you I'm, I'm completely celibate, so I have no life and I'm sublimating 24-7. So every day, I'm just work. that's what I do. Here's my, here's my laptop. This is, uh, you know, a room I kind of rehabbed over time. Uh, and I work every day of the week and I do 2,000 words a day. And that's in first draft. You know, Hemingway says, write drunk, edit sober. And I kind of <laughs> do that. <laughs> I don't drink. But I, well, I do drink, but not while I'm writing. And I <laughs> to clarify these things. But I, uh, so I just try to get the first draft down. Like Anne Lamott says, I give myself permission to write a crappy first draft. And then I try to get it good. I always say to myself, get it down, then get it good. I talk to myself a lot, as you can tell. <laughs> so I'm the only one who will talk to me anymore. It's really sad. <laughs> we love talking to you. So you're yeah, in the right. I could do this all day. 
<laughs> um, I have to say this first. Nancy Wakeley said that everyone was a little suspicious about what happened to the Fab Four tonight. They were a little worried we were taken. So. <laughs> Wait, what happened to the Bennetts? What happened to the Fab Four, man? Exactly. What happened, what happened to the F and Fs? Uh -huh. um, and Barbara Wojcik wants to know if you and Francesca will publish another book together. Uh, I really hope so. I really hope we will. I still write that humor column and she contributes from time to time. And you can read it on my Facebook page every Sunday morning at nine o'clock for free or subscribe to the newsletter and we send it to you because I know not everybody. I'm very proud that it's in the Philadelphia Inquirer, but not everybody lives up in Philadelphia. Otherwise, you would have this horrible accent like I do. Think about that. <laughs> I think it's a nightmare. Your accent. I once said, can I record my audio book? They're like, No. <laughs> Well, this could actually be like a leg up for you because Meg noted that Bradley Cooper is a Philly boy. So you mm -hmm. might have like a shot. I'm telling you, I I know I'm sending him Philly vibes. Cheesesteaks are coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Make me think of Rocky running up the stairs. Exactly, you know? girl. <laughs> All right. Terry Ziegler Randolph says, I listened to the books you wrote with your daughter during the pandemic. I know you want to hear this. They made me laugh and they gave me something to look forward to when I wasn't going to work. And I just love that. That's really, well, that's what I love about audiobooks too. You know, I, I'm a freak with them now. I walk the dogs for an hour and I listen. And I, it reminds me when we write, like, for example, when I write anything, I read the whole book aloud in the house. Like the dogs are like, oh my God, she's talking to the computer again. But you have to, to hear how it sounds, not just the dialogue, right? But the exposition too. And so I love that because I think that's who we are. Yes. Women yes. tell stories. We tell stories. Like you said at the beginning, endless yes. stories. I'm like, that's true. And you know how you find that out in every lady's room? Because in the first five minutes, somebody's going to start talking about something. And I'm going to tell you about thing one and thing two, my ex-husbands. You know, like we just start, <laughs> we start telling stories and it's the best thing ever. And, you know, I, I, that's why I feel so lucky to be able to do this job. because I just get to tell stories in print and. People read them and they write to me and it's very, very wonderful. We've talked a number of times on here about people who read their books out loud when they're in the copy editing stage or the yeah. final phase. And I was recently doing some edits and I only had to add a few things like an epilogue and a couple of scenes. And I went through and I read only those out loud to see if they had the rhythm, same rhythm as the book. And there is something very different about yep. doing that. Right. Right. I, I bet oh. that's it. Sometimes there'll be a tonal problem. I yes. notice sometimes, you know, if it's a tense scene, but you know, you write a tense scene. And the, the thing that I hope though, is especially if you don't know what's going to happen, like people say to me, you know, do you know how your book ends? I'm like, I don't even know how it middles. You know, are you impressed yeah. yet? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like freaking out from the anxiety when I write, but I, I sometimes think that that anxiety gets in and you find that tone because yeah. you're nervous. And then if you come back to it and you're not so nervous, then you're like, what is this? A walk in the park? Like, get in the car, chase somebody. You know, yeah. that's yeah. depending on the kind of thing you're writing. But that's certainly the Bennett's. I mean, yeah. what happened to the Bennett's is intense. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you don't start off like, and this family once lived in the boom, we're in a car. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I'm like, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> I know. Well, I think Kristen put her finger on it because I never had before Eternal wrote, I mean, Eternal takes all the, most of the domestic thrillers I write take place in like three days. And then when I turn, I'm like, Lisa, this is 20 years. Like, you got to move this baby along. <laughs> like, don't tarry, girl. And I obviously talk too much, as you can tell. And you get like a headache from listening to me. But I was like, well, let's see if you can get to the point for a change. And the funny thing is that um, writing these humorous things that yeah. I do every Sunday, which are really fun to read and read them just about life. And you can read them for free. Uh, is if you have 800 words to tell a story, I always think about cartoons, like a cartoon, you know, the characters are right there. The situation's right there. The resolution is like, boom. And yeah. I have that in mind. So sometimes I go try to get to the point, like see what it feels like. You might like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was supposed to ask you for a writing tip, but I think you just gave us like a whole string of writing tips. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh. so full of advice. Let me tell you, my daughter loves it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite thing? What? Uh, yeah. Um, it just made me think, Meg and I today, we're in New York, and we went to see uh, a, a matinee of The Music Man. 
Oh, we're so envious. Yeah. And I, saw you it just, I saw it. Yeah. Um, oh, nice. There's a song that Marion's mother sings to her. Uh, uh, what is it? Something about if you want to know what I think. Anyway, um, I don't know why it made me think about that. I know every, song, I know every word, does it? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. She goes, and she's giving her advice about men. Yes. Like, yeah. oh, and your library full of books. Yeah. Yes. She, she's like, don't let this one get away because you're an old spinster. It's a great message. I'm sitting there going, <laughs> I know, honey. Where were you when I needed it? But it's also <laughs> really dated advice. You're like, yeah, you like books. What's the matter with you? Okay. Luckily, luckily, there's Hugh Jackman to look at. Okay. And I saw the show with my daughter. And But the message is so wonderful. And you walk out of the theater. Well, that's what the arts do, right? Make all of us feel terrific and connected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But now back to the writing tip. Yeah. Even you get, you've given us a bunch. Give us, like, when you talk to, um, I know you do a lot of workshops. Give us your best newbie writing advice. Hmm. My best newbie writing advice is just do it. It's from a shoe company. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't, it, we're not talking Proust. You know, it isn't Anne Lamott here. Huh? I, but I think it is the best advice <laughs> to yourself because sometimes in the morning you're like, Oh, we love oh, you. you. I know. Me. Thank you. And I'm like, what, well, what do you got to do in this scene? <laughs> well, they have to, you have to get somebody across the room. Okay, there's that. But also it's like, just jump in. Writing is so behavioral. So you just do it and you don't judge it. Philip Roth, right? Great novelist, late great novelist, who I actually had a class with when I was an undergrad, said, you know, in an interview, he said, when you're a writer, don't judge it. It's not for you to judge. Stephen Sondheim says, you know, uh, stop wondering if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. Uh -huh. They usually do. You keep moving on. That is the job of an artist. And it's also the yeah. job of a person. You keep moving on. Don't care about what anyone thinks. Just keep so going forward and be you and just do it. And that's, and I think, you know, look, people who love this show and they're a legion know that you talk seriously about writing. And I hope the message they have is that they really can do it. We didn't yeah. go to any special schools for it, right? We just said, yeah. well, if she can do it, I can do it. And why don't we just try? And God bless you guys for supporting other writers because it's really wonderful what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Lisa, we love to ask authors for a book suggestion and we love that. But there's also a question that the New York Times Book Review asks authors that we love. Um, what book might we be surprised to find in your library or on your nightstand? Huh. Well, the last time I talked to the New York Times, <laughs> 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 I, okay, this is a dumb answer, but it's a true answer. Look, I have three dogs, right? And right now we're having a doggy with behavioral problems who's guarding his water at all times of the day. Oh, so God. what's on my nice stand now? <laughs> what I was reading last night, it, this is a lame answer, but it's a true answer, is The Monks of New Skeet. I sometimes have to go, I buy a lot of books. This is all research books, by the way. This is only one room of my house. I have books in every house. And I read, I love books about dogs. I read dog training books. I read, you know, Georgie, the Cavalier from England books. I, I just love dog characters and I need the refresher in training my dog. So that's, I don't know if that's surprising, but I can't believe I'm reading a dog that teach you know a book that teaches you how to tell the dog to sit. But uh, I have 13 year old dogs and I want them to sit. Oh. <laughs> it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Like it seems it's like it's a really easy concept. We have a new puppy. It's our first puppy ever, Lisa. Oh my god! There you go. I know, and it's amazing because I'll be like, oh, this isn't a big deal. Oh god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> But, um, but, but it is, it's like, you'll like watch a video or read a book from like a real dog expert. And like two days later, it's like, he can do the thing that you've been like banging your head against the wall. And you're like, oh, well, if I just read the book. Mordecai, Sieg Mordecai Siegel is my God, man. And it's life-changing. It's really life-changing. So that's my well, advice. Yeah. Let's see if the New York Times likes that. What do you think? Okay, <laughs> we're going to see if it's fit to print. Well, okay. it's yeah. National Puppy Day. It's National Puppy Day. So that was the perfect yeah. answer. Oh, perfect. So Lisa, if you don't mind sticking around, just 
please, for a few more minutes, we just have a couple quick announcements. Don't leave us. And okay. we are getting requests if any of your doggies are near that mm -hmm. people want to see some. No, but you can just post them on the Facebook page. They're, they're in the bedroom with socks in their mouths so they don't bark. <laughs> oh, my God, that's hilarious. Okay, just a few reminders from us. <laughs> Have you bought your coffee from Charleston Coffee Roasters yet? I know I have. I always do. They're my favorite long before um, this partnership. But everyone in the Friends of Fiction community gets 20% off all bagged coffee on their website with the code Coffee with friends. So I don't know about y'all, but I'm taking advantage of that. Also, be sure to enter our monthly giveaway. We're going to pick three winners, one each in March, April, and May to win a three month Coffee of the Month Club subscription, which is a $90 value. So get in it to win it using our entry form shared on our social media and in our newsletter. And of course, good luck. <laughs> Whoa, Christy, hold on. Don't, uh uh, don't you have something to show us? <laughs> Something huge, something no one wants to miss. I might, I'm so excited to get to show you guys this. I didn't think I was going to get to, but um, this is the soon to be released TV ad for the wedding veil. But I got special permission to show it to you guys before it um, goes anywhere else. So, Sean, here we go. One wedding veil for women, the family heirloom that symbolizes happily ever after. But even treasured heirlooms don't reveal some family secrets. Join these remarkable women as they explore their family history and its mysterious ties to the famous Vanderbilt family. New from New York Times bestselling author Christy Woods and Harvey. The Wedding Veil. On sale now. Well, thanks. Yeah. Not now. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's wonderful. That's a great <laughs> ad. Oh. You know, I'm really excited about it. So anyway, thanks for indulging me and checking it out. Um, yeah, I'm leaving on Monday for tour. I'm sure Lisa is too. Are you going on tour this time, Lisa? No, I'm, I'm no, still virtual. I'm still virtual. Okay. Well, while I'm schlepping around with my 20,000 suitcases, think of me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I'm super excited to get to come out and see everybody and um, I'll mostly be in the Southeast. But um, if you're in the Southeast, I'll be all around there for the next three weeks. So I hope I get to see a lot of you on tour. Yeah, That's she's awesome. going to be in a, a shopping cart and a Target near me. <laughs> Anytime. Right. I mean, most popular post of all time. So we'll definitely have to recreate that. <laughs> <laughs> And congratulations being on Target. That's wonderful. That's just wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm okay. Just, yeah, thanks. Go ahead. All right. So, you know, it is March Madness time, I'm told. Um, I mean, Christy's all about, and, and Patty's all about the March Madness. I don't not know. Not anymore. I'm not. Did you see that Tar Heel upset last week? Woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Auburn got knocked out on Sunday. Okay, keep going. Okay, so it's March Madness on the podcast. And we're talking about our writer's block podcast. Each week we post links under announcements. Each time a new one drops. I love that show biz word. A new episode launches each Friday. On the last episode, Ron and I talked to uh, Lisa and I's old friend, Harlan Coben. We love Harlan. We about love. his new novel, The Match. This week, Ron's going to talk to Christy about her new novel, The Wedding Veil. We know a lot of you have been participating in our very first Friends in Fiction Reading Challenge. And this month, we are encouraging you to read a book about a female historical figure, um, which, you know, not to be so self-promotional, but The Wedding Veil is about Edith and Cornelia Vanderbilt, if you're looking for <laughs> you haven't checked it off your list yet. Um, but I think we all, I think everybody here would have something really great for that. Um, but this month... Um, you know, if you're looking to keep track of this month or any other month, we do have an amazing, beautiful reading journal designed by us in conjunction with independent bookstore Oxford Exchange. It has a beautiful linen cover and inside there are all these prompts for you to fill out um, all your thoughts about the book. And um, our friend Anissa Armstrong, who runs the challenge, will be posting about our upcoming April challenge, a fictional account of a historical event. What would be a good book to read for that? <laughs> hmm. I think that there's somebody on the screen that has a new paperback of her fabulous surviving Savannah that would be perfect for the April reading challenge. So I'm trying to wiggle my eyes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and make sure you join us for our episode next week, next Wednesday, right here at 7 p.m. Oh, dear God, right at 7 p.m. I hope um, so. <laughs> where we will celebrate the launch of Christie's The Wedding Veil. And um, there might... <laughs> <laughs> and there might be some headgear that um that we all have to wear and some of them are Less kind of astounding so if you ever are wondering about our schedule it's always on our friends and fiction website and on the header graphic on our facebook page and then after that we are going to be on a two-week break between seasons but on april 5th because there will be a it is a special day because my favorite back is out. Yep. There will be a special video from all of us that will only be seen on Friends in Fiction. The five of us plus Meg and Ron all got together at the Ships of the Sea and we have a really special thing that will pop up right at the same time as the show. I feel like just keep coming on Wednesday at seven, right? I mean, yeah, well, dark, yeah. we will have content to play. Right. Yes. Okay, so now, Lisa... We have yes. one last question for you. Okay. And it is this. Um, God, I can think of so many last questions I would I like to I was going to say, I have, we yes. have even more, but yeah. It sweet. would bleep me if I asked them, but I won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, we don't have a bleeper. Oh, no. <laughs> we need okay. okay, here it is. It's an easy one. What were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up? What did oh, Mother Mary tell you about reading? <laughs> Do you know what my mother told me about reading? My mother told me, stop reading, it will ruin your eyes. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I love my parents so much and they were wonderful to me because they made me feel like I was the best thing since sliced bread. But there was not a single book in our house. We did not, it wasn't until I got to a library that I started to read for pleasure. And my mother still was like worried about my eyes and I'm really nearsighted so, but I'm happily nearsighted because I love books. So that's the real, I mean, that's the real truth. I mean, and I think it's really, I, I'm glad you asked because honestly, not everybody, even though I got so much love in my house, not everybody grows up having their reading encouraged by their parents. No, they don't. And they just that's don't. So and that's why the library was so big for me. And I just have a lifelong love of reading that was encouraged by librarians and by school. And, yeah. and you know, towards the end of her life, my mother started reading and I was like, see, it's not so bad, ma. Yeah. <laughs> You influenced her. That's awesome. In that wow. way. She told me to curse and I told her to read. It worked out great. I love it. <laughs> and Nick Spaghetti. Lisa, you're amazing. Thank you so much for spending time with us. You inspire us. You give us writing tips. You make us laugh. You are, we just love you. Aww. So before you go, can you tell everyone where to find you, your new book, your tour, all of that? Tell everyone where to find you. Oh my God, I'm not even sure. Well, I'm virtual, so it's all right. virtual. So that if they go to scottalini.com, there'll be a schedule there and they can okay. see it and hopefully come to some of the events. Awesome. By, in their chair. And they can see you on, I'll, I'll be attending. And they yeah. can see you on Lisa Live, right? We're doing these fun Lisa Lives. I don't know what that I is. Do I know what that is? On Lisa Live. Oh, right. Oh, uh, right. On Monday night. I don't know. I don't remember. Just go to the website. I, like, I saw you, right? You were wearing a veil. You were wearing your, you had you were wearing wearing a veil. veil. That's right. You were wearing your first communion veil, as far as I knew. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I threw it away. That's it was awesome. $2. All but right, I, Lisa. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And love Christy, you. best of luck. I will be reading the book. I can't oh, wait. You. Well, you and, too. Uh, it's exciting. I, you know, I love all of you and I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate having, you know, that you have me on. I really do appreciate it. We love you too. We love you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Bye, bye Lisa. They bye. will. Bye-bye, guys. Oh, all right. One more thing before we go, or a couple more things before we go. If you are not hanging out with us yet in the Friends and Fiction Official Book Club, you are missing out. We say it every week, but we want you to join. It's a lot of fun. The group, which is separate from us and is run by our friends, Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now more than 11,000 strong. They just had Christina Lauren on earlier this week, last, no, Monday night. I'm so mixed up. The, every day is running together. It was fantastic. And then on April 18th, Christy will be on talking about the wedding veil. And one of the great things about the book club is that after the first half hour, um, they they have spoilers. So it's one of the few places you can go where you can actually find out things that aren't 
talked about in most virtual conversations online. So please join that group. Please read the wedding veil and then show up for all the secrets on April 18th. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Don't forget to come back next week. Same time, same place to celebrate our Christy with the launch of the wedding veil. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.